worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I don't need no rocks to cry out for me. I know too much about him. I know what he's done for me. And he's worthy. And I will praise him. Our text this morning, we hear in Psalm 34, David saying, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. His praises shall continually be on my lips. I've got something to praise the Lord about. Amen. And because he's been so good to me, I will always give him praise. Early in the morning, I'll give him praise. In the noonday hour, I'll give him praise. But late at night, I'll give him praise. He's worthy. Anybody know God is worthy of praise? Yeah, he's worthy. He's worthy of praise. This is, this is pretty good. Everybody get one of these? I think what I'm going to do is uh, I have a habit of putting stuff on my mirror in my bathroom. And I'm going to empty this bag of all the seeds except for one. Because Jesus said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, and I think that'd be more than sufficient. Amen? Amen. Well, we're here today thanking God for 55 years of his faithfulness. 55 years of his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. And uh, you know by now that um, the theme for our 55th anniversary is celebrating our identity in Christ. And so I just remind all of us that because of what Jesus did at Calvary, because of the blood that he shed, because he cleansed us from our sins, because he chose us, when we invite in him to come in and save us and be the Lord and Savior of our life, that put us in a special category. Our identity in Christ Jesus makes us a special people. Look at your name and say, you know what? You so special. <laughs> you are special, set apart, redeemed by the blood, filled by his spirit. We are special people. A amen? And so when we think about who we are, and we, we, we start preaching and teaching on that several months ago because I wanted our children to know who they are in Christ so that nobody else would try to uh, hoodwink or deceive them in thinking there's something that they're not. We wanted those who had been bullied to understand that in Christ Jesus, they're special. They are somebody. We wanted single mothers whose husbands have walked out on them to understand that, 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 that you are special. You know, your identity is, is, is solid in Christ Jesus. We wanted men who are out of work and, and to, to not get a hung up or hang up on their employment status, but understand that they are special. Our identity in Christ sets us apart. And people need to see that we're special. And so I want to share a few thoughts with you this afternoon on the subject, uh, celebrating our identity in Christ by doing three things. And I could very well uh, change it to say, um, demonstrating the genuineness of our salvation. Because if our salvation is real, if we've had a change in our heart because of our faith in Christ Jesus, there should be some evidence of that change. You would agree on that? There needs to be some proof somewhere. There needs to be something to show that, man, there has been a change. All right? And so that's our Christian, our, 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 our identity as, as believers should put us in another realm, another category of behavior. Does that make sense? And so we celebrate our identity in Christ, Brother Oliver, by doing three things. Number one, we demonstrate how real our identity in Christ is by how we 
uh, uh, honor the past. How we honor the past. We show how real our identity is in Christ by how we deal with stuff in the present or how we embrace the present. Okay? How you deal with issues says a whole lot about your identity in Christ. And then thirdly, uh, our identity in Christ is demonstrated by how we anticipate the future. And so what we're going to be looking at is three aspects of the powerful work of God in the life of a believer. We look at what God has done in the past. See? We look at what God is doing now. And then we look with anticipation towards what God has promised to do in the future. And so our identity in Christ really is revealed. It's like, you know, fire has a way of burning out impurities. When you put something in a fire, that which is not real is going to be consumed. Folks, the closer we get to the end days, things are not going to get easier. This is not me saying that that's what the Word of God says. In the end days, it's going to get a whole lot crazier than it is now. And somebody said, well, Pastor, when I look around and read the paper and see all this food, how much crazier can it get? Folks, it's going to get bad. But that's why our identity in Christ has got to be real. Okay? And it will be reflected in how we look at what God has done, how we look at what God is doing, and how we anticipate what he shall do. Amen. And so that's what we're going to try to do uh, uh, today. And so we're really talking about uh, celebrations and, and, and we've got so much to celebrate. And you find here again in the text uh, for the morning that I selected in Psalm 34, that would be the primary text we look at. Psalm 34, uh, we hear uh, David saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord and let the afflicted hear it and let them rejoice. Come on, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You know, that's a, that's a command. That's a directive. That's an invitation for all those who are in Christ Jesus to glorify, to exalt the name of Jesus together. The context of this Psalm 34 is actually found in 1 Samuel chapters 21 through 22. It takes place at a time when, when David's population or popularity was really growing. Had the women in the streets saying, you know, that Saul slayed his hundreds, but David killed his thousands. And, and Saul was the king, and David was this young warrior. And so uh, because of David's heart, because of his faithfulness to God, God blessed David, and David found favor with God. And it got to a point where Saul got really embittered and very jealous. Uh, um, uh, children's choir, uh, do people ever get jealous of you? Do some of your classmates ever get jealous at you? Jealous at how you do in class? Okay. Uh, people will get jealous. And when people get jealous, they start doing crazy things. Amen? Stay away from jealous folks. And so, so Saul gets jealous of David, and he puts out a contract on David's life. He resolved that he was going to kill David. Sometimes folks get so jealous, you know, uh, it's that old nature of, in them. They, 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 they don't look at what God is trying to do in their life, and all they have to do is complain about and, and be jealous and envious of what God is doing in somebody else's life. Amen? And, and so uh, he puts a contract out. David hears about it, and David uh, hightails it out of the area. David runs down to a city called Gath. Incidentally, it's the same place where uh, Goliath was from. Really interesting, running to a home place of your, your enemy. Very interesting thought there. But he goes to Gath and he hides in a cave. See David this afternoon hiding in a cave. I'm not going to even give it credit as being a man cave. But he was just hiding out. See this brother hiding. Somebody said he was hiding. He was discouraged. He was filled with doubt. He was in deep despair. Where do you go? Where do you hide out? Where do you withdraw to when you're discouraged, when you're distressed, when you're in despair? 
And don't say you hadn't been there because every one of us has been there at some point in time. Amen? And so here he is hiding out, feeling bad, discouraged, depressed. But then all of a sudden, David begins to reflect on his life. David begins to turn the pages of the history of his life and God's relationship with him. He began to turn the pages back. I remember I was a little shepherd boy, minding my own business. And I looked up and suddenly somebody said, you're going to be the king. I was out one day looking after the sheep, and a bear comes along and grabs one of the little lambs, and, and something came over me. And before I knew it, Sister Rossman, I was grabbing that lamb out of the bear's claw. And it was God that did that. And then I found myself standing before this giant named Goliath. Before I knew it, I just took a couple pebbles. And with my little slingshot, I just whirled it around and I let the rock fly. God directed the trajectory of that rock. God made sure that rock hit Goliath in the most vulnerable place on his body. And Goliath, David begins to remember. It wasn't by my power. He begins to remember it was God's grace and God's favor uh, that had brought him where he was. It's a good thing to stop in the midst of your discouragement, in the midst of your despair. Be careful to what voice you're listening to. Satan wants to keep you there based on guilt. Satan wants to say you're not anything. You will never amount to anything. No use in you dreaming about a better future. It ain't going to happen. But then if you wait patiently and if you listen intently, you'll hear a small voice saying, I chose you. I set you apart. I put my spirit in you. Don't let nobody tell you what you can't do because it ain't nothing too hard for the one who lives in you to do. And so David begins uh, to remember. Uh, and, and, and while he's remembering, it's like something begins to stir up inside him. Somebody, somebody said, you know, uh, uh, I said what I wasn't going to do for the Lord. And no sooner than I said that, and all of a sudden, I felt something that felt like a fire that began to well up in my spirit. When I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, before I knew it, I couldn't help myself. Because I had a testimony, and I had to tell it. So David begins to sense something stirring up and and suddenly his cave of despair turns into a house of praise. Help me, Jesus. From from, from his his doubts, as he began to remember, began to give way to confidence. His discouragement uh, is replaced by a spirit of celebration. This boy turns the cave into a place of praise. How and why did he do that? Well, the the narrative, the Bible says, David begins to to lay out, you know, here's the brother sitting here just thinking. Maybe he was looking up at the the stars one night. And he began to remember things that God had done. He began to remember the past. Verse 4 says, he remembered that the Lord had delivered him, verse 4, from all of his fears. God delivered him from the fears by reminding him, I'm all you need. I am Jehovah God. I'll fight your battles. I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. So so God delivered. Anybody got any fears? Now, now you guys sang a song. What was that song y'all said? What was some of the words of that song? Jesus promised he would what? Take care of you. So you don't have anything to fear. You don't have to fear anybody who thinks they're a big bully. Because Jesus said he'll do what? Take care of you. So David realized that God had delivered him from all of his fears. And if God delivered David from his fears, my friends, he'll deliver you. From any fear 
that you might have. You don't have to fear getting a pink slip, getting laid off. You don't have to fear uh, 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 not having medical insurance when you need it. God said Amen. he will take care of you. So, so David says, you know, the Lord delivered me from all my fears. And then in verse 6, he said, and then the Lord saved me from all of my troubles. Anybody have any trouble? The Bible says, oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we don't take everything to the Lord in prayer. If there's trouble anywhere, take it. Oh, man, it's silent up in here. <laughs> I mean, do you see the blueprint? Take it to the Lord. He says, not only that, but in verse 7, look at what he says. The Lord encamped his angels. All around me. You've got to understand some of the benefits of your identity in Christ. God dispatches angels to encamp all around you. What does that mean, Pastor? It means that while you're in your home at night, you may think Mid-South got your back. But the reality is that it's God's angels that have encamped around you. When you're rolling down Interstate 20, you're not rolling down by yourself. God has encamped his angels all around you. He said, I'll be your banner. I'll be your shield. So we can walk in confidence knowing that God's got my back. Not only does he have my back, he has my flank on both sides. And he's going before me. Oh, my soul. Do you see this testimony? And then in verse 9, he says, And the Lord supplies all of my needs. And then in verse 15, he says, The Lord listens to my cries. Verse 22, he said, The Lord redeems me. By this time, this brother's up on his knee, on his legs. This brother, I see him shouting in his cave. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. And he said, And I'm going to brag about the Lord and all that he's done for me. Anybody got anything to brag on the Lord about? Somebody needs to hear you boast in the Lord. How will they know unless you tell them about the goodness of the Lord? Pastor McCaleb would always say, don't rob God of his glory. If God has done something for you, you need to give him the glory by telling somebody about what God has done. Amen? Amen. And so this brother, is, he's gotten to this place of praise. Uh, as followers of Christ, all of us, folks, we've got a reason to celebrate. And that is the subject. We've got a reason to celebrate. And because we've got a re reason to celebrate, you know what we need to do? Celebrate. Let me say it again. We've got a reason to celebrate. Okay? Don't let no cave or your situations or circumstances rob you, prevent you from celebrating. Remember who you are. You are a child of the most high God. Amen? You got a reason to celebrate. Well, we look at the three pieces to this, as I said. Uh, because of our identity in Christ, number one, we, 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 we demonstrate the genuineness of our identity by how we honor the past. Honoring the past is remembering what God has done. In Psalm 150 verse 2, uh, David says, Praise him for his mighty acts of power. In other words, David is saying, God has done some powerful things. And so we praise him for what he has done. Throughout scriptures, throughout the scriptures, you find over and over again, God saying, remember. Remember. See, remember. Remember. When you come into that promised land, and you're eating all that milk and honey, mm. when you're drinking from wells you did not dig, you remember who it was that brought you. Amen. The word, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, there's a word that is a zalar or zakar, zakar, Z-A-K-A-R, zakar. Zakar is a Hebrew word uh, meaning remember, but not remember uh, for the benefit of just recalling facts. Rather, remember so that some actions 
will result from your having remembered. So in other words, uh, when you pause and remember what God has done, it should result in you doing something. In David's case, when he paused and remembered what God had done, he gave God praise. He rejoiced. He celebrated. And so God said, when you get into that land uh, of milk and honey, remember who brought you. Mm -hmm. So you won't be vulnerable. So you won't be tempted to drift and go in the wrong direction. See, he says it over and over again. Remember Hezekiah. He got word, get your household in order because uh, your time is up. The Bible says Hezekiah got on his knees. He prayed, Lord, uh, remember uh, my righteousness towards you. Remember, oh God, my faithfulness to you. And the Bible said, and the Lord remembered Hezekiah's faithfulness. And the Lord gave him an additional 15 years. God remembered and God acted. Moses, when the Pope folks start acting a fool, Moses is up in Sinai receiving the law. The folks are down there saying, well, we don't know what happened to Moses, so we better create us a God we can worship. God got so angry. He said, now these people you brought out. Mm. See, see, he said, uh, they are stiff-necked people. I'm tired of them. I'm angry with them. I'm going to destroy them. Moses says, Lord... Remember your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says God remembered his covenant and he relented from destroying the people. This whole idea is when we remember what God has done, that should result in our doing something about it. At least we can say Thank you. (laughs) Parents, grandparents, have you ever sacrificed to give something to your child or your grandchild and nary did you even receive a thank you? You want to say how ungrateful can a person be? We celebrate our identity in Christ by remembering where we have come from. We remember the sacrifices that were made so that we could be where we are. We remember the sacrifices of our parents. My mother was a domestic worker. She worked in other folks' home, cleaning their house and all that stuff. My dad was blue collar. He always uh, had several jobs. But all I know is we always had what we need. But the older I got, the more I began to understand the sacrifices that they had to make for me to get what I have. We remember the sacrifices of those early pioneers who put their very lives and their jobs on the line as they marched, as they protested, as they resisted the inhumane treatment to a people of color. They were willing to be beaten. They were willing to be lynched so that we might live in dignity. Amen? And so, so we have to remember. Remember the sacrifices that others have made. And when we remember their sacrifices, it should induce us to want to live better. It should, it should inspire us to want to build on that foundation. It should to compel us to make them proud. The last thing we want to do is to, to, to see their dreams for us die. Amen? And so let me show you how this thing works. We celebrate our identity by honoring the past. Remember what God has done. We remember the sacrifices of, of that first generation green force. Y'all remember on a certain day, all the white members of the church left, including the pastor. And so it was just a handful of black folks that remained. But God in his planning. See, God always has a plan. Oftentimes when we start thinking about remembering the good old days. Yeah. And so many times we long to go back to the way things used to be. But you got to be careful because that can paralyze you. 
it can hold you back from moving forward. But we've got to remember that, that when we look back in God's history, God from the time man fell has implemented a master plan. And from generation to generation, God's history with each generation are merely the stepping stones that's leading to the ultimate fulfillment of his plan. See, ultimately what God wants to do is to reconcile all men, women, boys, and girls back to him. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short. Nobody is exempt. We've all sinned. The Bible says there's a penalty, there's a consequence for sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God that is part of his master plan is eternal life for all who believe. So when we look back on history, we say, wow, look at how God was building his plan. So God used the Reverend John Cross a, 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 a battle-experienced uh, preacher who was in the area. Uh, he used him to clear the land, to get the process started. He and a few other faithful members, and God began the work of Green Forest in their lives. But then as history went on, look at God. The time came that God was about to open a new chapter. And he called a young visionary by the name of Dr. George McCaleb to become the pastor of Green Forest. What McCaleb did was, consistent with God's plan, he laid the foundation. He brought the vision. He brought the mission uh, 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 of, the, of the work uh, to bear on Green Forest. Amen. And Dr. McCaleb said it over and over and over again. He reminded this congregation to remember that the, the church, that, 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 that uh, uh, this is Jesus' church. Well, 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 this, is the church. this is the Lord's church. Amen. And Jesus Amen. is Lord. Amen. He admonished the church over and over again to keep the main thing, Amen. the main thing. Amen. And the main thing has always been faith and obedience to God. Amen? Amen? And so you see how God began to move. Amen? So when we look back over our history, and when we see how God has begun to move, uh, then it should cause us to want to respond by doing something. And so what does it mean for us? It means, again, we don't want the sacrifices of those who went before us to go wasted. Michaela, uh, uh, Reverend Cross cleared the land. Dr. McCaleb laid the foundation. Now the baton has been passed to us. And it is our responsibility to build on the foundation that has already been laid. And so when I look back, help me Jesus, on, on, on the past and what God has done, my attitude of gratitude, my being thankful to God, should lead me to say, okay, Lord, I will take the baton and I'm going to run my leg of the race. I will be faithful using my gifts to help Build this structure for your honor and for your glory. And so when we look back on what God has done, there's an opportunity for all of us who are members today to recommit ourselves, to rededicate ourselves to fulfilling the vision. Find them. We have enough seats for a whole lot more. Find them. Invite them. Bring them. So that we can start working God's magic of building them up so that eventually they can be sent out. Amen. Opportunity. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul want to cry out, hallelujah. But more than that, it should compel me to action. Recommitting, Green Forest. Here's our opportunity. Looking back with appreciation. Looking back uh, in order to move forward. Recommitting ourselves to finding, bring them in, growing them up, sending them out, and then recommitting ourselves, each of us individually. If you're part of this body, this is part of your responsibility. And that is to be a part of building 
a biblical community, not worldly relationships, but a biblical community of loving relationships. Where members, rather than gossiping, where members, rather than pointing the finger and criticizing, members look at Jesus and say, that's my example. He gave himself as a sacrifice. It's so amazing. Jesus didn't come to be served. And unfortunately, many in the Christian church today, across the world, come with an attitude, what's in it for me? They come with an attitude that this is a country club and my tithes and my dues. And because I play my dues, I expect to hear the music I want to hear. I expect to hear the length of sermons that I want to hear. Amen. And if it don't go down that way, I'm going to be mad or I'm going to go somewhere else. See, that's not what we see in Jesus. His attitude was just the opposite. I came not to be served. I came to serve. I came to give my life a ransom for many. And so once we look back, and remember from whence the Lord has brought us, it should do something. It should compel us to want to recommit, rededicate ourselves to building this biblical community right here at Green Forest Baptist Church. Amen. So one thing is, our real identity is revealed by how we honor the past. If we look at the past and say, that was them, and I'm going to do my own thing, that says a whole lot about who we are. If, if, if when we look back on the past, and it, it builds such a spirit and a, a sense of gratitude and thankfulness that it compels us to keep building, then that says a, lo a lot about the genuineness of our identity in Christ. Does that make sense? Well, there's a second thing that uh, our, our identity in Christ uh, um, uh, does, uh, and that is it helps us to embrace the future, okay? Embrace the future. Get it, look at it this way. How many of you are concerned about, let's be honest, how many of you are really concerned about the state of our economy? And let's be honest. See, some of y'all have kids in college, you're paying their tuition, one day they're going to graduate, your retirement strategy is that they're going to repay their own student loans, but they're not going to be able to pay their own student loans if there's no jobs to be had. Now, let me ask again, how many of you are concerned about the state of the economy? Yeah. The state of our medical care system. Yeah. I think that Obamacare is good. But there's an intentional strategy to uh, use misinformation to discourage people from signing up. See? And so there's all of these issues out there. How do we handle retiring when, 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 when health care costs are out of control? You know, how do we handle debt when there are no jobs out there? Our identity in Christ is revealed by how we embrace the challenges. See, if we walk around looking defeated... If we're walking around moaning and complaining, it calls to question uh, whether or not I really have been redeemed. Whether or not I am convinced that there's nothing too hard for God to do. If I'm walking around moping and complaining and discouraged and dejected, I have to question, is my salvation true? Look at this, look at this. Because of our identity, what did Jesus do? Jesus said, look, boys, I'm going to leave you. And I know you're going to be concerned about trying to do life by yourself. But I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. Because I'm going to send back another. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Comforter. And the Comfort is going to bring back to your remembrance all the things that I have taught you. Bring back to your remembrance so that you won't cave under the pressure. Bring back to your remembrance so that you will be able to walk with confidence and with courage. Amen? And so we're not out there by ourselves. And so when uh, 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 our identity in Christ enables us to embrace the present uh, with confidence, with courage, and with boldness. That's why uh, Paul in Philippians 4.4 4 could be locked down in prison a dirty, dingy, mildewed, infested prison, and yet write to the church and say, Rejoice in the Lord, the brothers in chains. And he said, And again I say, Rejoice. 
His brother's uh, circumstances did not prevent him from celebrating who he was. He understood his identity in Christ. He understood he was a child of the most high God. He understood nothing was too hard for God to do. He understood that God had a plan and God could work his plan at any time. And that's what we need to understand, that it doesn't matter what our circumstances are. We can still rejoice in the Lord because I am sure about who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm trying to say to somebody, you may be going through something, but boy, you remember what God has done. You remember what his word says. That's what we stand on his word. His word says, no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. His word says, the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, he reminds us that, that we are more than conquerors to Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So all I'm trying to say is, we can celebrate our identity even when obstacles come before us. See, a couple things you do. Number one, the Bible says in Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God. Because what we're going through, folks, if it prevents you from being everything God has called you to be, is spiritual warfare. And if you're going to be in spiritual warfare, you better suit up. So when we played football, Coach would say, suit up, boys. You didn't get out on that field, you know, w without a suit on, without some protection on. And he says, put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have the, the belt of truth around uh, your loins. Put on the right shoes. Have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Put on the whole armor of God because you're in spiritual warfare. Amen. So here's what I'm saying. I'm almost there. I'm almost done. Our identity in Christ enables us to handle whatever Satan throws at us. Okay, because we're clear on who we are. Amen. Uh, uh, when we put on the armor of God, that gives us that protection not to defend ourselves, but to go on the offensive. See, Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's an image of a church that's not retreating, but a church that's on the move, pushing darkness back, pulling down strongholds. Amen. So we put on the whole armor of God. The second thing we do to be able to embrace, are y'all following me on this? Second thing you do to be able to embrace uh, 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 the present is to fight with the right weapons. See, we don't fight this battle with the weapons the world uses. The world uses criticism, ugly words, bickering, backbiting, deceit, violence. Uh uh. We got a much more powerful arsenal of tools at our disposal beginning with that incredible tool called prayer and that's why he says pray always amen prayer is the most powerful weapon you have for embracing anything satan comes against you it's prayer prayer changes things prayer takes the the seemingly impossible and makes it possible See, prayer has been known to change conditions. It's been known to open locked jail cells that enable the, the, the captives to come out. Prayer has power, but we'll never understand it until we pray. That's your most powerful weapon is prayer. Secondly, it's the word of God. See, knowing it because the Holy Spirit, as you study it, the Holy Spirit puts it in your spirit. And when that situation comes up, he'll bring it to your remembrance right on time. So we battle this warfare with prayer, with the word of God. And then there's, there's a couple of other pieces in your toolbox you got to have. And that is faith and obedience. See, you got to trust God to do what God says he can do, even though it don't make no sense. See? then it's obedience. And that's why God says, if somebody comes at you all ugly and mean-spirited, you don't square off and get in their face. 
You see, you love them. Now think about that, y'all. I know that's hard because some folks, Lord, knows they're hard to love. But that's the tool. There is no defense for love. Think about it. You come, you know, I come at you with all that mess and all I get is love. I've already come with mess. What else, where else can I go? When I come at you with love, then that operationalizes God's power. And so you come at me mean spirit, intending to do me harm. I love you, then the power of God in, 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 uh, 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 inherits or is part of that response of love, and that will get in your spirit yeah. and make you so uncomfortable that you got to back off. I'm trying to say, we've got to do it God's way, Green Forest. We do it God's way, we're going to see some mountains begin to move. We do it God's way, we're going to see some hearts begin to change. If we do it God's way, we're going to see a reunification of this congregation. We do it God's way, we're going to see the lights come back on, shining brightly, powerfully as a beacon across this community. We do it God's way. And God will be glorified. Amen. 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 So, our identity in Christ uh, is uh, evidenced by how we handle the past. It's evidenced by how we embrace the future. And then finally, I'm sorry, how we embrace the present. Finally, um, our identity in Christ is evidenced by how we anticipate the future. See? Nobody knows what's going to happen this time next year. Nobody but God. See, God knows what's going to happen. Amen? Because our identity is in Christ, notice what has happened. When we gave our lives to Christ, we went through this baptismal process. When we were lowered down in the water... That symbolized our identifying with the death of Christ. When we were brought up out of water, that symbolized our being raised in the newness of life. We received a new identity in Christ. Here's how it works. Believing, this is why we have hope for the future. Believing that Jesus died. And rose again. This is what Paul says in Thessalonians. So we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. In other words, that same Jesus that died on the cross, that same Jesus who shed his blood, that same Jesus, yeah, who was buried, that same Jesus who three days later got up with all power, that same Jesus who 40 days later ascended back to heaven, the Bible says there's going to come a day when the archangel will shout, when the trumpet will sound, and all those that are dead will be raised from the dead, and those who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the sky. Because Jesus died, arose, and lives again, we have hope for the future. We may suffer on this side, but I'm here to remind you that our current sufferings, they don't compare to the eternal glory that we're going to experience when we're with Jesus. We have hope because we got a home in glory. We got hope because Jesus has already won the victory. So we can look forward to the future with hope, with anticipation, with joy. Because of what Jesus has already done. And so, Peter says, in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Always be ready to give an answer for anyone who asks, Raven, why are you so hopeful? 
Okay. But you know, if we're looking discouraged, if we're looking like we've been sucking on lemons, <laughs> if we're sad all the time, why would anybody ask us? Because there ain't nothing about us that's giving any evidence that we got any hope anywhere. See? But see, if our identity in Christ is real, we got hope. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. And so there's no reason for us to be downcast. We need to hold our heads up high. So David says, and I wrap with this, he says in verse 2, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. In response to what God had done, David decides in his cave to break his silence. David may have realized that he'd been in the cave long enough. He may have recognized that he had been running and hiding from the Lord long enough. He may have realized that he'd been silent long enough. So he decides to, to remember what God has done. And when he remembers what God had done, he begins to celebrate and rejoice in the Lord. He decides to break his silence because the Lord has been so good to him. This was the same David that said... I once was young, but now I'm old. And during the course of my life, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Because God provides for his people. God looks after his people. What about you today? Have you been hiding long enough? Is it time for you to break your silence? If God has healed you at any time, you need to break your silence and begin to rejoice. If God has protected you, you need to break your silence and give them praise. If God has delivered you through some trials, through some tribulations, through some hard times, if God opened doors that nobody could explain, you need to break your silence. If God has sustained you while you're out of work and you don't even know how you've been able to manage, you need to break your silence and begin to give God the glory worthy him. If God has protected your family, break your silence. If God has blessed you, break your silence. If you're able to retire, break your silence. If he woke you up this morning, you need to break your silence. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises, his praises, because he's been so good to me, his praises will continually be on my mind. Oh, I'll worship him. I'll praise him. I'll thank him. I will exalt him. Exalt him. Praise him. Praise him. Is he worthy? Is he worthy to be praised? Bring for us. If he's worthy, then that's your basis for celebration. It's time to let the celebration begin. Amen. Somebody could say, I, 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 I got to praise and I got to get it on. I got to praise. When I think about him, I, I got to praise. I got to praise and I got to get it on. I got to quick praise. Come on, son. That's been good. I got to praise. You know it. I got to praise and I got to get it on. I got to praise. Everybody, come on. I got to praise. I, I got to praise. I can't hear you in the balcony. Come on. Come on. Let me hear you. I got to praise. I, I got to praise. I got to praise and I got to get it out. I got to praise. I, I got to praise. I got to praise and I got to get it out. I got to praise. I got a praise and I gotta get it out. 
I gotta pray. Yeah, hallelujah. We've got something to celebrate. And one of the most powerful witnesses, the most powerful witnesses that we can give to a cynical, discouraged world is to demonstrate our joy and our celebrated spirit wherever we go. And folks, if you will hold firm to the truth that what God has done before he's still doing it, if you hold to the fact that great is he that is in you than he that's in the world, if you hold to the hope that one day he's coming back and we're going to live again in eternity with him, if you hold to that, then your continence will reflect a joy in your spirit. And somebody will come asking you, tell me, how can you be so joyful? Father, we thank you. You have, uh, we don't even have the words to express our gratitude and our appreciation for who you are and all that you've done. So God, we just say thank you. And God, we know that you are ready for us to ready ourselves to go where you're trying to take us. Oh God, help us to keep our eyes on you. We thank you. Now God, I pray for those that are here today who really don't know what we're talking about, can't really understand the concept of joy that surpasses understanding because they've not met you. And so God, the time for playing church is over. The time for just going through the motions is over. In these days, you are calling for men and women and boys and girls to make a genuine commitment to follow you so you can give them a new idea Identity. So, Father, for those that are here today, I pray that your spirit will give them the courage and the boldness to say, I want all that Jesus has for me, and I want it on this day, my day of salvation. So, God, draw them, draw them, draw them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.